Inside Pediatrics contains real-life surgical scenes in a hospital environment. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Inside Pediatrics. She's not been able to do other things like normal babies. She went from TCU purple to pink in about 45 seconds. I don't know if I'm ready for him to have to conquer what he's got to conquer to go home with us. <laughs> in the middle of America lies one of the busiest independent nonprofit children's hospitals in the country. So go inside the operating rooms and the transports. Go inside each family's journey, each patient's story. Go inside pediatrics at Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Joanna Crossfield is being induced into labor to deliver her son Tobin. Tobin's lungs are too small, and he has a hole in his diaphragm. Your cervix just said hasn't been checked. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and check your cervix and OK? We showed up early this morning about 7. The progress is going slowly, but we're getting there. They said that they're getting everything set up next door, and they're ready whenever Tobin's ready. So I don't know if I'm ready for him to have to conquer what he's got to conquer to go home with us. So it's just rough. Nobody wants to witness their kid go through anything like that. Push you right in here. Cool. Cool. As they walk through the doors of the Elizabeth J. Farrell Fetal Health Center, Matt and Tara Jarvis know that they will soon have to face the most emotional days of their lives. Their daughter Piper has severe abnormalities, and she might not survive. I'm not nervous for the delivery. I guess I'm more nervous just to make sure she's doing okay. I'm anxious as just as she is about the unknowns we have. And I think that'll get less as we know more. So it's kind of a watch and wait. I want it to be over. Isn't that funny? That's an oxymoron. I don't want anything to happen, but I want it to be over. Blah. You been contracting at all? Or? Oh, yeah, it's pretty tight up there. Life-changing surgeries happen every day at Children's Mercy. Today, a rare bilateral cleft lip and palate repair is the first procedure of the day for pediatric plastic surgeon, Dr. Xiao Zheng. Mariah was born with a bilateral cleft lip and palate. She had uh, two clefts, one on either side, and the middle piece then grew unrestricted. So it was literally sticking out from the tip of her nose straight up into the air. Mariah's first surgery reconstructed part of her cleft lip so she could eat and grow. Now Dr. Zhang will rebuild Mariah's nose and lip. We're gonna make parallel incisions on either side, get rid of the old scar, bring these two side pieces into the middle and narrow the middle quite a bit and then bring the nose in. She's not been able to do other things like normal babies. It goes as far as feeding, as far as talking, and she also has hearing problems as well. So cleft lip is just the looks of it. It's more of a, her not being able to grow up as a regular child. It was frustrating, hard, it was nerve-wracking. I went through so many emotions during this. It's, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> For the bilateral double cleft, the kiddos always look extraordinarily different okay. uh, right after surgery. And then gradually, family sort of ex uh, get used to the look. She's going to look totally different. <laughs> yes. I'm just waiting to see the outcome. I'm OK with her looking like this now, but I just really can't see how much better he can actually make it. Little Mariah will have a completely new appearance when her mother sees her again. The Jarvis family waits outside Piper's delivery room. Tara has been in labor for almost 23 hours. All the imaging, all the testing can help us prepare before the baby even comes for the worst case. In the delivery room, immediately when the baby's born, I need these people here. I need a cardiologist with an echo machine. I need needles ready in case I have to drain fluid. Being able to address the needs of the baby in minutes instead of an hour or hours. 
Not only are we better prepared, but the parents are better prepared. Uh, if you can sit around a room and say, these are the issues we think your baby may have immediately afterwards, the parents can know that going in. Push, two, three, good, four, five, six, seven, eight, She's very realistic with the outlook for Piper. She knows that there are some scary things that may happen in the future. She's really retained her sense of humor. I think that's helping her cope. Eight, nine, ten. Oh, shoot. Very good. You moved her, sweetie. Okay. Good job. Okay. Good job. 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 Good I had no idea they would at least put her on my belly for a little bit, so that was a little refreshing, and Matt got to cut her cord. The Jarvises hope to hear one little cry from Piper, but there is nothing. Piper's family looks on, hoping for a sign that she'll survive the first tense moments of life. The closest I could get was right outside her door. And luckily, we positioned where I had a window to the suite where they brought Piper as soon as she was born. When showtime hit, when, when they brought Piper through those doors, best I can describe them as a, a NASCAR pit crew in scrubs. And every time they walk past, you're waiting for them to come and say, we're about to bring her to you to take her last breaths and you're done. So you want to cry and be sad. When she went from TCU purple to pink in about 45 seconds, oh. oh. It's hard not to be optimistic when you see stuff like that happen. Uh, she's breathing. Let me see how her lungs are working. So. But she's moving around and her eyes are open. So. Leave that dark here. Yeah, it's a lot of oh, dogs. Piper is fighting to live, and the Jarvis family is cautiously optimistic. Ever since June or July, when they started talking about the aortic arch and being hypoplastic, we were you know, expecting to have someone bring us a baby and, you know, after 10 minutes, and that was all we get. And so the longer they were in there, I think we were feeling more and more relieved. Um, and then when cardiology came in and said it's a lot better situation than we thought, we were like, wow, that's great. Every hour we have is good. We'll check in then. You know, let's don't think about what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's just be happy with what we have now. In the operating room, Dr. Zhang is beginning his delicate procedure to rebuild Mariah's nose and lip. This is Mariah McCant. We're going to do a repair of a bilateral cleft lip nasal deformity. She has no allergies. We're going to use some antibiotics. This is the most important part of the operation. We're going to draw. Essentially, we're going to mark out our planned incisions. We're measuring in millimeters. It's pretty small to see. The hardest part is to bring yourself to the point where you feel comfortable taking it apart. Because in order to put it back properly, you have to undo everything that nature has made a mistake on, and then trust in your ability to put it back together as if it was meant to be. So again, we're putting together the muscle layer. This muscle layer allows you to pucker and blow kisses to your parents or loved ones. So it allows you to suck on a straw. Things that we take for granted. These kiddos don't have the opportunity to do unless you put them together the way they're meant to be. So now the lip is starting to take shape. OK, raise it. One, two. Four. 
Recovering from surgery can be a big challenge. It's been just five days since Winston's open heart surgery to reroute the blood flow in his deformed heart. With help from Dr. Wagner and the Children's Mercy team, Winston has beaten the odds. All right, let me take a listen and we'll pray for her. He's not in any respiratory distress and chest x or should no uh, complications. It's just so hard to see your baby go through pain. And you try to stay up for them and it's just hard. And from ID standpoint, no signs of infection, possible discharge today. He's doing great. <laughs> I was so scared that after anesthesia and everything you went through that his personality wouldn't be the same. And they tell you it's going to be the same, but he's back. It's his old Winston self. Now, Winston's heart is functioning more efficiently so he can grow and thrive. It's such a blessing and I'm feeling so thankful <laughs> and joyful at this stage. Next door in the fetal health center, Joanna Crossfield is moments away from delivering her son. The team is ready to give little Tobin the support he needs. We know that when babies with CDHs are born, they're going to need a breathing tube right away. They're going to need to get the GI system evacuated with an OG tube. We got to put lions in, and everybody has their roles, everybody has their responsibilities. We train for this. We have simulations a couple of times a month, so we know exactly what we're supposed to do in this situation, and I think the team did really well. Yeah. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with the breathing tube first. Yeah. I got it in. I would say Tobin is doing better than we expected. A lot of times when the babies come out, they have difficulty ventilating and oxygenating right from the start. He's getting rid of carbon dioxide and getting oxygen in. Just to keep track of that. He's doing really well, guys. Sometimes we get a little too hopeful because they come out and look pretty good at the beginning, so I think the next 24 to 48 hours will really paint his picture and we'll kind of get a good idea of how it's ultimately going to progress. Yeah. Dr. Wardy leads the Division of Pediatric Nephrology at Children's Mercy. Ranked as one of the top programs in the country, the team uses the latest research to treat children with urinary tract and kidney disorders like Julio. Julio, how are you doing? Good. Good? How was your drive from Wichita? Good. Did you drive? Wish, but no. You wish? Not quite yet. My name is Bradley Wardy. Uh, I'm the director of dialysis and transplantation. So Julio is a young boy um, with a disorder called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis that's associated with the loss of protein from the kidney and ultimately the development of kidney failure. And he's dealing with one of the probably the most complex of all kidney problems that we see in pediatrics. Julio received a kidney transplant two years ago. While transplants usually provide a cure for this condition, Julio's disease was too aggressive. In Julio's case, the disease reoccurred in his kidney within the first week after transplant. Sometimes you can tell in his eyes, because his eyes just like, he looks tired all the time, or he doesn't want to talk, or he'll just stay in his room, and then I know something's wrong. So on a zero to 10, if I ask you how you felt, zero means I feel terrible. 10 is I feel great. How would you say you feel? 10. 10, okay, well, that's a good thing. His kidney function is still pretty normal, uh, but he still requires plasmapheresis because we haven't been able to eliminate the loss of protein from his kidney. So what we have to decide is whether we give another dose of that medicine called Rituxan okay. in, in Wichita when he's back home. Mm -hmm. And then my goal is to hopefully decrease the amount of phoresis he's getting. Okay. Maybe we can go to once a week instead of twice a week. Okay. Thankfully, we have 
uh, pediatric nephrologist also in Wichita, Kansas. So they provide him with his plasmapheresis two times per week to, again, keep things under control. And then we see him once a month. Okay. So we can work with that. Are you okay with that? If we yep. have him do it at phoresis? Yep. Okay, you're very agreeable today, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm? Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. Goodbye. See ya. Good seeing you. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> While Mariah is recovering from her cleft lip repair, Dr. Zhang gives her mom a first glimpse of Mariah's new nose and lip. So this is when we get started. Mm -hmm. This is after she's asleep. That's a breathing tube. The okay. eyes are taped just to prevent anything from dropping in there. Ready for the next one? Yeah. So when we're done. Oh, my goodness. Nice pouty lip. <laughs> really full. Oh, my god. Yeah. I was a little nervous in talking to the mom. It's because every child after surgery looks dramatically different than pre-op. So this is from the bottom of You can see how she has two nice nostrils. Yes. Oh, my god. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, again. That is nice so pretty. Nose. Yeah, yeah, I'm so happy. I just. She did good. She did good. She I did don't good. know. Just... She did good. She did good. I'm just so happy. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> Seeing the difference has made me feel like a proud parent. I'm happy that my daughter can actually look like a, a normal baby. I get to actually smile with her. I'm just, I'm ecstatic right now. I feel very privileged to have parents trust me uh, with their child and let me do for these children what needs to be done. Tonight is going to be a family night. My family wants to come and actually, you know, see her and how beautiful she is, and we're just going to enjoy it. The Children's Mercy Clinic in Wichita helps Julio have the best quality of life he can, while Dr. Wardy monitors his condition in Kansas City. Any problems with your line? Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner for Children's for the Department of Pediatric Nephrology. I work for the Wichita Specialty Clinic, so we have a clinic in Wichita that has full-time nephrology. Any belly pain? No. Nope. How's your brain doing? I sure think it's growing. Well, Julio was a Children's Mercy patient originally, and then he ran on hemodialysis here with Children's Mercy physicians managing the care. Since he needed chronic phoresis, that was closer to do it here for his family instead of having to travel to Kansas City twice a week. Now that he has a transplant, it's not sitting in doing dialysis four hours, three times a week, compared to here and just come maybe two hours, two and a half hours all together. The faster, the better. He's still getting Children's Mercy level of care, but just being able to be remote here. Anything you want to talk about with me? No. No. OK. So I'll see you on Friday. Yeah. Okay. Eight years now. That's all I know was him in and out the hospital. Just one day at a time. That's all you gotta do. The Children's Mercy Neonatal Intensive Care Unit is the only level four nursery in the region, providing infants with complex problems the highest level of care. The hospital's Center for Infant Pulmonary Disorders is a recognized leader in improving treatments for babies with lung problems like Tobin. All right, Dad. Everything okay? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say good, but he's doing a lot better than we would have thought. Crossfield just delivered and is looking better than anybody had anticipated but we've got a long way to go with him, and I think the next 24 hours will be really telling. When would you think you would do surgery? Um, we'd like to get him about 24 hours out, see where he's at, and then make a decision. But remember, we know that just fixing that isn't gonna suddenly yeah. turn things. In fact, in most cases, it makes them sicker because the stress of surgery. Yeah, certainly there's this sort of honeymoon phase with babies with diaphragmatic hernia, where for the initial 12, 24 hours, they actually look really good. And then they start getting sick as they're really transitioning off the fetal circulation and, and becoming more dependent on their own circulation. So it's really too early to know 
how he's going to do. I'm just glad to hear he's doing better than what yeah. was expected of his numbers. Yeah, absolutely. So are we. All right. Congrats again. All right. Thank you. Go say hi to Appreciate mom. it. I'm going to go let her know how everything's going. After two days, baby Piper is still in critical condition, but her mom is being discharged. Tara is torn between hope and fear that Piper might not survive. I'm really emotional today. Not about leaving her here because it's the best place, but we thought we were not going to see her this far. So it's hard to have hope leaving because if she would have died, it felt like, why, why did I have to do that? It's hard to tell everyone from the outside that please don't be overwhelmed with excitement for us because I don't want that at all. We're just being very, very careful with our emotions. I'm silly and I'm funny and sometimes inappropriate, not the best example in my everyday life, but when things happen to people that hurt, you hope that people see your true heart. It's not that I deserve pain, but there could be a reason that I'm being an example for someone else in pain that they saw my family, and they saw us have hope, that they grasped onto every little good thing. And it wasn't the end of the world the whole time that baby was alive. So every step we get is a blessing, day by day. And I don't want to look further than that. I'm coming. on the next episode of Inside Pediatrics. When I first met Dr. Daniels, he told me she might not make it. I was ready to be done. I didn't care anymore. At some point, we have to sort of bite that bullet and, right. uh, and get it fixed. With the stress of surgery, we don't have a whole lot of things we could fall back on. 